Welcome to the uh, city and county of Broomfield, the Audi, um, and our partners with Adams 12, that it continues, it used to be quarterly we would see each other, and now it's every day there is something that we are deepening and enhancing these relationships. We appreciate you guys coming out. Um, I'm gonna keep it really short so we can get to the most important things, particularly with the VIP front row folks that are sitting here, the most important people, and the eighth grade. How could I forget the eighth grade row, which is elevated above the second grade? We're excited to start this. Big shout out to Catherine um, for really taking so much of what we've talked about in a vision and making it real. This is a start of things to come with our partnership with Westminster, um, bright ideas, a lot of folks have ideas, some folks have bright ideas, and then you have the folks that actually execute on those ideas and make it real. And that's what we're hoping this series can bring. Um, we have some of our folks out with, um, we just had Garden Center 6 that has been a labor of love in order to get a maker space, um, or as uh, Adams 12 and MindSpark um, design studio. If we're coming into the 21st century, it's not makerspace anymore. So we're trying to adjust to those, um, those new timely relevant phrases. And they're out front if you'd like some additional information. Um, next month is in Westminster. In June, in June I'm sorry. Um, June 7th, and we also have some additional handouts. And with that, I'm going to introduce Tracy with um, Adams 12, and she's gonna take us into this program for this evening. Thank you very much. She's taller than me. <laughs> so hi and welcome. My name is Tracy Calderon and I am a STEM coordinator at STEM Lab. STEM Lab is a K-8 school that is one of three STEM schools um, in Adams 12. We are represented here by two of our STEM schools uh, with students. So we have second graders from STEM Lab, eighth graders from STEM Lab, and then we have high school students from North Glen High School. STEM Launch is our other K-8, and they are unable to be here tonight because they have several other events this week that they are attending, but we are representing them in spirit. They run in the same model as we do. I want to thank the Broomfield Library and Westminster Library for hosting us here tonight. We're very excited to share our model and the things that we are learning. Um, so we were invited because even though we're in North Glen and Thornton, we Adams 12 serves Broomfield and we are schools of choice. So there are several, several families in Broomfield that we serve. And additionally, um, there are plans to bring a fourth STEM school online in the baseline development area that will potentially start up in 2021. So who are we and what do we do? I'm gonna answer that question by kind of taking you back a little bit. Remember your school days? The things that were exciting for you to buy every year, go back to school, not so much technology, really a lot of paper. There were great things about school when we were kids. Some of it our kids still enjoy. Some of it paved the way for the things that our kids enjoy. And there's those things that we'd rather leave in the past. Having been a teacher for 18 years and never used any of this equipment, I cannot imagine planning days and weeks in advance to have this kind of support in my classroom. So there are things from my past that I do wish my children could experience, both in school and out of school. I remember very distinctly being excited to find the lunchbox of the year that reflected what I was excited about. And then there's things that are very well left in the past. Um, personally, I cannot imagine parenting without cell phones. Even though my son won't pick it up until the fifth time I've called, I can't imagine rotary phone technology anymore. So, but not everything has changed. I mean, this is from when I was a child, but we still have family dinners. We still have family movie night. I have to say, though, that this picture makes me excited to drive a minivan. And so when your kids come home, how much of their day 
resembles what your day was when you were in school. How much of their day, you're like, you bring home the worksheet and you're like, oh yeah, I remember this, I can, I can do this. And if you didn't remember how, you have better technology to learn to help them with what they are learning. What I remember of this research is I needed the P-book for my penguin research, my brother needed it for Pompeii, so we were both late on our assignments. Nowadays, our kids have so much information in their pockets, so much information we don't always want them to have, because they don't know how to think about it yet. And I remember school in my time, sitting in our silent rows, doing what the teacher told us to, absorbing the teacher as the keeper of all knowledge, all the things that we needed to know to be successful. And then there's classrooms today, kind of look the same in a lot of places. We still look at school as the place to bring us knowledge, to just impart on us the things we need to know to be successful, and there's a problem with that. So that's where Adams 12 STEM schools were born. We recognize that all careers, especially STEM careers, the employees of those jobs especially 10 years and 15 years down the road when we have no idea what those jobs are even going to be, they need to know how to think about ideas, how to think about information that we don't even know yet. And so we built the STEM model to be able to teach kids those skills. It's based on some cornerstone ideas, collaboration, creative and critical thinking, um, problem solving. So problem-based learning is one of the biggest cornerstones of our STEM system. And you see some of the topics that, have, um, that are popping up on the screen over here. These are some of the problems that our kids engage with. So instead of just going through and teaching content, teaching science, teaching math, we're teaching through problems that are happening in the news and that parents are talking about around the dinner table. And students are learning their content while they are applying that to the problems that are happening in their world. We teach through collaboration. Those rows from that previous picture, those are gone. There's not a job in the world that you're gonna have anymore that you, t you do in a silo. And it's a skill. It's a skill many adults struggle with to work productively in a team, so why not start teaching that now? And failure. Failure is an awesome thing. We're so worried about performing on tests that frequently we're really concerned about the right answer but besides being able to innovate from failure, failure also teaches us persistence and it teaches us a growth mindset that it, with some application and effort and learning, we can keep solving problems. Communication, you're gonna learn a lot about what that looks like in our STEM schools tonight. Uh, we start kids really, really young, not only public speaking, as you will see, but also technically communicating with experts that are working on the same problems they are. And the creative and critical thinking. So it's not just for art anymore, and it's not just for music. We bring critical thinking into math and science and into just plain fun. Because the more you think outside the box, the easier thinking outside the box becomes. So the world is different, and we think school should be different as well. Our first group that's going to come up is from STEM Lab. They are our second graders, and they have been they worked this past fall um, on a problem around supporting pollinators where we live. So I would like to welcome to the stage Anushka, Heba, Abby, Garrett, and Trey. The Mega Danius Flag Support. By Anushka Patel, Heba Kutsi, Abby Prather, Gay Carpenter, Trey Rico. Table of contents, you might want to look back at solution because we might be able to solve this problem and citation to see if we can, because that's where we got all this information. Problem, how can we increase the number of plants so we can attract more pollinators? Change, more people than land. What we mean by more people, what we mean by that is Houses are blocking pollinators' homes, so pollinators are dying by that. P 
pe more pesticides than before. What we mean by that is because people are spraying more pesticides than they used to, so pollinators are dying, less flowers, less pollinators, less food. What we mean by that is people aren't wanting the plant flowers or they don't have enough room, so pollinators don't have that much pollen to pollinate, so we don't get that much food like fruit. No one is planting plants. Solution. We want to put our sanctuary at Webster Lake by a river, but not too close by a river, because they may be they may be bugs, but they still need water like everything else. Because if you don't have water, you don't have life. We want to put it by a park, but not too close to a park, so kids can with their parents can come in to see the pollinators, kind of in the natural habitat. 3D model from Tinkercad. This is this is our model that we created together, and this is our um, sanctuary. Action! So we're gonna we're gonna make a fundraiser of selling seeds. Um. So um. We can. So so we can get the materials that we need. Get materials. So when um, after the fundraiser, uh, we're gonna get um, money to build our sanctuary. Cost. One of the most important things for Monarch, the butterfly, is milkweed, and that's twenty-one dollars and forty-nine cents. But for all pollinators, it's trees and plants, and all together, it's thirty-one dollars and ninety-five cents. Ecosystem. More people than flowers and gardens. What I mean by that is the earth is like a seesaw, it's not balanced. Safety for all. Everyone is safe. People and pollinators are safe when the earth is balanced. Citations. These are some of the websites we use. HomeDepot.com, Amazon.com, HaikuDeck.com, and SinkYourCat.com. Quote, Nature Always Wears the Colors of the Spirit by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, thank you for watching our presentation. So these gentlemen were given a problem about light, light pollution and they were allowed to choose which aspect of light pollution they wanted to tackle. If you look at a night sky or a night photograph of the United States, in North Dakota and the Dakotas, there is a bright, bright, bright spot that rivals New York City, San Francisco, LA. And those are the fracking flares from oil production on those plain states. So these gentlemen decided to take that piece of light pollution on as their, as their problem. This is our fracking flare solution. I am Julius. I'm Blake. And I'm Taylor. All right, so fracking flares, what are they? They're used to burn off excess oil, methane, natural gas, etc., as to prevent backups and other issues that could occur as well as to not flood the market. The issues they cause is light pollution and they put out many, many noxious fumes. So here are some criteria and constraints for our project that we created. So it, can't be cost, it cannot be cost prohibitive for us to test, us to create, and us to make. So um, another thing is it has to get rid of the light pollution because that's the whole sort of gist of this problem. So we also figured that since if we're getting rid of light pollution overall, the flare itself should go too. Um, constraints, here, we have to have it done by that date, which was the due date for our project, and it has to be testable in the classroom. These are our 3D models. This is our rough draft of what it was originally going to look like. And this is our final draft with the, this is the oil and then that is the two pulling, the original rig pulling the oil out 
and that is the sorter, and then which goes into the storage tanks. All right, so this is our structure function table, what the objects are and what their purpose is. So we're going to start out with the tank. This is basically used to store all the materials that are collected. Then we're going to move on to the injector. The injector serves the purpose of injecting the separant. So the rubbing alcohol in this case, which is used to separate the densities between the two objects, whether, whether that be oil and natural gas or natural gas and propane. So as we move on, we're going to use a mass spectrometer to determine the density as well as what material it is. And then a computer takes this data, processes it, processes it using a density sensor to say, okay, this was the last reading from the mass spectrometer. This is the density of this object. So I need to, mo I need to use the, suck the straw in order to suck it out and put it into the different location. And then we use metal to build tubes to transport this material. Um, we, for our testing data, I made a program on agent cubes because we can't test it in real life because that would cost more money than we are allowed to have. So this right here is the oil rig, and then the black part is the tube, which goes down to the white block you can see right there, which is the mass spectrometer, and then it gets pushed into the storage tanks. Uh, these are the positive and negative consequences on human health. There will be less smoke and noxi noxious fumes from the, from the burning of the various oils and gases. There will no longer be exposure to the chemicals from the burning. There will no, be, no longer be any methane released into the air which is contributing to global warming. Um, some of the negative consequences are it would cost more than, a reg than it would increase the price of getting an oil rig. And there might be gas leaks that will pollute more and affect local towns. All right, so the big deal here is we got, got it so there would be much less light in the night sky in this area. The other big deal is there's less disruption of ecosystems that rely on light to determine when the animals are hunting or when they're sleeping, etc. And then birds are much less disoriented as they use light to determine where they are traveling. However, there are going to be some issues such as global warming will increase instead of in more in one spot around the whole world. The other issue is there will need to be more trucks, which makes it more prone to accidents. Okay, so some other positives of our design. It's going to cut back on all these noxious fumes that have the potential for hurting people. They have the potential for injuring people, and that's not good. Um, we also have a cutback on light pollution, always great. Um, on top of that, it also clears up the night skies, but so I don't know about you, but it's easier to sleep when it's dark out, so I much appreciate that part. Um, some negative parts about this is gas tanks and storage tanks are gonna, gonna have the possibility of being overfilled if humans do not clear them out, move them to where they need to be, and just sort of go on with that. Um, th with all this increased traffic for moving all this material that we're gaining, there's going to be increased truckers, which means higher chances for accidents. All right, so these are our payback calculations. First of all, we added up all the costs of every single item that we were going to need to buy. The big cost item was the mass spectrometer coming in at around $100,000, which is a big deal when you're trying to test this in a classroom. But we ended up... <laughs> We ended up totaling at around $142,618.80. So in order to calculate our payback, 
we came up with the price of oil at that time, which was $2.66 a gallon, and then for natural gas, $2.50 per cubic foot, and $2.10 per cubic foot of methane. Then we used government sources, which all fracking companies are required to fill out, and by filling, by filling this out, they gave us data that we needed to determine how much money this would make or rake in as time were to go on. We ended up calculating our total payback to being about 27.98 hours, just a little bit more than a day. These are just some sources that we used. This is what the night sky usually looks like. And this is what it should look like if it wasn't so blurry and a pixelated Im image. <laughs> That's all. Hi, my name is Natalie Grambart. I'm Penny Loftusness. And my name is Savannah Van Dyne, and we are all seniors at Northland High School STEM. So we are all seniors in the um, school um, STEM program, and we are in the fourth year capstone class. What the capstone class is, is the it's accumulation of the past three years of the STEM pathway in either engineering, biomed, or by design. And what the class potentially is, is you take everything you've learned the past three years, and you combine it to do one big year-long project where you find a problem in or you believe is important in society or in some local business, um, you try to think of a solution, and through that process, you create prototypes, test them, collect data, and form a final presentation paper and a big presentation to give in the spring. The, the capstone class is also a nice um, combination, as it's often done with students between both the engineering and the biomed pathway, as it is with us here today. And we were given the opportunity to have a partnership with the Denver Zoo. So we, uh, all the capstone class, both capstone classes were offered the choice to help create an enrichment for their primates. We were specifically given uh, the primate, uh, the red-caped mangabe. And so we have Francis and Kendi. This is a photo of Francis. So Francis is a 16-year-old female, and Kendi's a 9-year-old male. Uh, Kendi tends to be more, uh, more energetic. So what they asked us to do is to create playful behavior between the two to get Francis and Kendi to play together more. So these are some enrichments that the Denver Zoo currently uses. So they use a fire hose and they stick different materials inside to try to get their foraging natural behavior out. Um, they also use plastic balls that they can just bat around on the bottom of the enclosure. The Houston Zoo actually uses basketballs and we were thinking about going down that route, but it's not a very economically stable solution because they go through one basketball about every week. Um, and they pop them within one day, so it would be an everlasting thing that we would need to purchase. And then the Denver Zoo uses a PVC puzzle that allows them to put scents and other materials in there to provide an intellectual challenge. So when we started this project, we were given a a series of constraints what we had to do to, when we were designing our prototype. The biggest issue the Denver Zoo had with any um, object put in the enclosure is safety. It had to be safe for the mangoes or any primate, meaning it couldn't be sharp, toxic, um, they couldn't ingest it, and it couldn't cause any harm to them. So we had to design our prototype around that, making sure that if it didn't meet those requirements, we couldn't even test it. The Denver Zoo also wanted us to create two enrichments so that there would be no dominance between our two mangoes. Since Kendi is um, a male, he tends to dominate over the current enrichment devices, which l leads to Francis not playing with them, which is the current problem they have now. And we also had to make sure that um, it had to be reusable so that you know, we couldn't just have it do it one time, have them like it, and then, well, it's gone now, so buy it again, which therefore is not a very economically you know, stable option. So these were our initial design concepts. We initially came up with four different enrichment devices because we wanted them to incorporate a playful behavior between both of them, being able to play with multiple devices but play together. 
So our first idea was to create a hard plastic ball that would hang to have the same concept as the basketball, but something they could hit while hanging around. And then we have the swing with um, like some type of mobile beads or something in the middles because they re they're really interested in noises. And then we had car strips that would just hang and those they can just bat around. And then we had another idea to create a stump. They're very interested in the stumps already in the enclosure. And they're, uh, we wanted to incorporate a tearing motion that they can tear fake bark off of. And then there's a reflective uh, surface underneath because they like reflective, they like tearing. So this is our budget and materials that we've bought so far. So we decided to go with just the swing option and we'll make two different swings to put in the enclosure. Um, so first off, we bought a wooden dowel that we decided wasn't going to be put in our final design. Um, and then our washers and the wooden pieces are used for the center to make um, the noise aspect. The wooden plank is being used as the base of the swing. Uh, the sisal rope is being used to attach it or to hang it, essentially. And then the carabiners are being used to attach this to the pre-existing ropes in the enrichment so that it's easy for the zookeepers to put in and out as they please. Um, so as a total, it came to $102.77. So our first prototype that we used for testing was the wooden swing, shown here on the left. And in the middle, we have both the wooden blocks and the metal pieces, and they have a little bit of freedom in their movement, so the mangue bees can bat them around and move them, create that noise that they really like to hear, and really engage in the enrichment. And then the swing has um, four holes for the rope to attach to, and we decided to go this route instead of just doing two holes on either end, because it was safer, it, it didn't twist as much, and it wasn't as dangerous in terms of flipping, which, would, which was a concern the zookeepers had with our original idea. And then at the top of the ropes for hanging, we used two carabiners to reattach it and take it out of the enclosure when needed. So the zookeepers could clean it or remove it if there was some bad weather that could damage the enrichment device. And then we were given a resource by the Denver Zoo, which is a ethogram. And we use this chart to collect our data while we're visiting them in their enclosure. So we use this in ethogram. <laughs> uh, we describe the behaviors and then like the specifics of the behaviors. So each group member knows what that specific behavior is. So we all have the same data. Okay, so this graph is of a 15 minute time period that we took data. This is before the enrichment was added to the enclosure so that we could see if there was a change in behavior in the monkeys. <coughs> Um, so this bottom row right here is going to be all the time that they spent grooming, um, which was a significant portion of the 15 minutes. And then this row right here is going to be all of the time that they were interacting with each other, um, whether that be direct physical grooming of each other or if it was just they were in the same um, area and they seemed to be interacting with each other. And then the second one is after we put the enrichment in. So these two little spots down here are Kendi interacting with the swing directly. He pulled it up to himself. He tried to get on it, but wasn't quite sure if he was comfortable with the device already. Um, and we were kind of disappointed with this results because it didn't seem like they were interacting with it as much as we had hoped. But after talking to the zookeepers, they were actually really pleased with the results that we got because they had placed plastic balls in the enclosures before and Kendi hadn't touched them for two months. So the fact that he was intrigued by it, he, they were really excited. Um, they're hoping that if we leave it in there a little bit longer next time, he might play with it a little bit more. So our second prototype that we are currently making right now is um, creating a second swing so that both mangue bees can interact with it. Because what we noticed the first time was the swing we had put in the enclosure, Candy would play with it and touch it and try to get on it. But since Candy was doing that, Frances wouldn't go near the swing at all because she thought he had taken over it. So she spent her time in the corner, and that's kind of the behavior that we want to get rid of. So our goal is to create a second swing similar to the first one in that it has beads in the middle and it's made out of wood and like has four attachments. Except we would modify the swing a little bit getting rid of some of the pieces in the middle so that they move around a little easier, so they can make more noise and hopefully engage them more. And then our way to modify the swing a little more to get some different data 
is to attach some pieces at the bottom, two wooden blocks and two plastic balls. Those would be attached to the bottom about a foot off to see if adding those attachments would increase or decrease the amount of engagement with the enrichment. And it was also to see like they could climb on it, if they would play with it, if it would change anything at all. And then we also decided to modify a little bit on the ropes on the side by adding, by adding a um, attachment piece that would like kind of cinch the rope together so it, it wouldn't twist as much or um, flip or wrap around. Because that was a concern these zookeepers had when putting ours in the enclosure, is they spread it out really far to try and avoid that, which kind of put it really high, high off the ground, which was kind of hard for them to use. All right, so right now we're working on finishing, finishing our second prototype. So we're gonna make a second swing and then incorporate all that, fix this one, get the next one going. And then we're going to go back for testing and then make any final uh, corrections that we need to make and then go back for our final testing and then complete our written report for the end of the year. Um, so we're gonna finish the school year off by having a uh, capstone Expo. It's going to be on May 2nd at North Glen High School if you guys are interested in coming by and seeing what we ended up finishing our project by or asking us any questions about our design process. Thank you for watching our presentation. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, we had planned to also have um, Jack Bonneau um, come and talk about his business. Um, he is a local to Broomfield. Um, but unfortunately, the flu got him this morning, so he is not here with us. Um, so that is all we have for tonight. Um, but I did want to mention a couple things. Um, the next Bright Ideas is going to be with the Family Theater Company, um, and that will be at the Westminster Library in June. Um, and then we'll have one of these each quarter. Um, presenting a different group um, that is doing innovative things in our community. Um, I think these guys will stick around a little bit in the lobby to answer any questions that you may have, with the exception of, I think, the, some of the second graders went home um, because <laughs> they have school tomorrow. Um, but thank you all for coming, and um, we hope to see you at our next one. And also, there's some information um, out there about the STEM schools if you want to learn more, um, as well as um, the op grand opening for our makerspace, um, which is going to be April 14th. Um, so come stop by, ask some questions. I kind of want to look at that swing up close. And um, thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>